All right, gang, welcome aboard once again for the uh, weekly Mac Forum video chat. We're uh, up to the April 23rd edition. Hopefully uh, you enjoy the uh, information we have for you tonight. So I'm going to do a real quick uh, page update here. And let's see who our newest uh, member is uh, for this week. And it looks like our newest member is it looks like Amy Cher, and uh, welcome to them and to all of our new members. And uh, let's get right on into the forum roundup this week. Uh, in addition to the forum roundup, we've got a couple of uh, iOS tips for you uh, for your iPhone use, and uh, just one or two pieces of general information and some information about uh, a few free Apple uh, applications if you haven't already. Uh, heard that uh, notice. So uh, let's get right into things and see what's happening. All right. First of all, um, as you know, if you've been watching the show the last couple of weeks, uh, there is a ongoing thread uh, in the forum about people, uh, these applications, uh, vendors, etc, 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 sharing personal information uh, about their users, sometimes without user permission. Sometimes uh, they have permission, but what they're allowed to use it for is a little bit nebulous. So uh, that's been going on for a while. And I linked to that thread. Uh, the last post in it is from, remember, uh, Harry B. concerning uh, Samsung's uh, recent uh, thing where their voice uh, navigation, their voice remote application kind of scoops up all kinds of information and sends it to servers because it's depending upon scooping up the content of conversations so that it can parse that information and figure out what you want it to do. Well, in the process of doing that, uh, if, you're, if your remote application behaves that way, it can scoop up some information that you might not want to uh, want others to know about, even if you're not doing anything wrong. And I link to that thread as a precursor to get to this one. Uh, let me just flip real quick. Uh, there is um, a lawsuit that's about to be filed in a federal court in the United States here because of Bose headphones. Now, uh, let me just kind of see if I can boil this down. Uh, what happens here is that someone who purchased uh, a set of Bose uh, Quiet Comfort headphones, uh, and as you know, if you follow this kind of technology, those things can run upwards of $350, uh, depending on where you buy them. Uh, and in addition to the headphones, there is an app that, that Bose kind of suggest that you download. Well, the problem is that, that what they're being accused of is basically scooping up all kinds of user data. That is to say, they're scooping, they're accused of scooping up playlists, uh, other kinds of information. Uh, if you download the app and put it to use, okay, they want to get your audio preferences, what you listen to, what you don't listen to, because uh, as, as it's mentioned in the article, um, the kind of audio that you listen to gives you, uh, gives people a lot of insight into what things you like or don't like, okay? And so they're, what they're being accused of is, as this article says, uh, the defendant's conduct quote, demonstrates a wholesale disregard for consumer privacy rights. Uh, that's basically the complaint that they're passing on. They're not making it clear to customers that they are passing this information on to other providers. So that's something that you'll want to keep an eye out for. Uh, this came from the Fox Business uh, website. And I will be including a link to this article as well as all the things we talk about uh, in the show notes. Those are already up, by the way. I got a head start on that this week. 
Uh, got them up before the show this time. Uh, let's move on and see what else we have in the, in the uh, thing. Uh, okay, here we go. Free stuff. You got to love free stuff, right? <laughs> here we go. Uh, Garage Band, iMovie, Keynote, Pages, and Numbers all now have one thing in common, and that is you can get them free from Apple. Uh, now, in the past, they've been sort of semi-free, okay? Semi-free in the sense that when you purchased a new device, you could get the applications for free. So if you purchased a new iPhone or iPad, for example, you could get these programs, the iOS versions of the program, for free. If you purchased a new Mac, you could get the Mac versions of the program for free. But if you wanted the other versions for the other platform, you had to pay for them. Well, this week, uh, Apple uh, announced that they are going to offer these uh, programs for free. So they're not tied to the purchase of the device anymore. Uh, you can, this is a good way to pick them up. And um, I'll give you an idea in just a minute about some of the, what some of the commentary has been. But that, this article by uh, senior editor Mac Wolf, uh, Raymond Loyola, will give you uh, some ideas, more, a little bit more background about it. As you can see, this is current. It was posted on uh, the 18th, which would have been last uh, Tuesday, so less than a week now that this has been available. Uh, and I hope you find uh, that useful. Now, you would think that free apps would be something that everyone would be thrilled about, okay? Well, uh, Macworld contributor Dan Morin has a, a different view. Uh, this came out, this article came out uh, a couple of days afterwards. And I wouldn't suggest that Dan is against having these things for free, okay? But it's more, he does point out a couple of drawbacks. Okay, and, and one of them is, well, let's say you use pages just as an example, uh, and you would like some feature added to the feature list. Well, because the app is now free and Apple is not making money off of it, there might be a little less incentive okay for them to make improvements and uh, the other people who might be a little upset about this are third-party developers now why would third-party developers be a little bit upset well let's suppose for example that you uh, are a developer that's created a alternate word processor okay third-party developer maybe especially the smaller developers and you've created a word processor. Now, one of your selling points has always been that your price might be similar to Apple's pages, okay? So you kind of got a fair shot. But by cutting the cost of pages to nothing, Apple becomes sort of the 800 pound gorilla in the room. A lot of people are gonna try their free app before they try your um app your variant of word processor and same is true for the spreadsheet for garage band which is the audio editor numbers um you know all of those things are going to have that same issue now that's one potential downside uh my grandfather would have put it this way you get what you pay for you know uh, there's less incentive if the app is free to keep developing uh, new features. Now, that's not always true. We can, uh, if we think about it, we can always think of apps that are free that have continued to improve over the years. But certainly, they're going to have to work really hard to resist the uh, temptation to rest on their laurels, so to speak. All right. Now... I want to move to a different perspective on that same issue. Uh, Kirk, the iTunes guy, Kirk McLaren, writing at his Kirkville website, 
mentions the same idea that these applications are free, but he has a different, a slightly different take. He thinks, or at least suggests that one possible reason for making these applications free is to compete with uh, Google Docs and also the Apple, uh, the uh, Microsoft Office 365 platform. And it's an interesting idea, be, especially when you consider that the uh, these thin clients, like the Google Chromebook, for example, where your software is in the cloud on some server somewhere, and what you've got for a client for a connecting machine is a very basic computer that doesn't have just a massive amount of storage space. Okay, so you are dependent upon the uh, the software in the cloud, whether it be Google Docs or iCloud or whatever, to uh, provide you with access to the software. Now, that's starting to catch on in schools, and uh, he concedes that, uh, Kirk concedes that maybe Apple is starting to go after this market. Now, the other thing that he mentions that might be a reason for them taking this approach is very simple. Uh, Kirk thinks, and he's thought this for a while, that what we are seeing in computing is a shift toward services. Uh, that is in the sense that the money that's going to be made is going to be a lot of times in services like iCloud and Google Docs. And, you know, I believe it was uh, Larry Ellison at Oracle uh, several years ago, maybe as much as a decade now, I'd have to do some digging to find the uh, reference to it. Uh, I just thought of this literally just a minute ago. Uh, Larry Ellison, I believe, was suggested several years ago that there was this possibility that instead of uh, buying these uh, large applications, expensive applications like Photoshop, uh, Microsoft Office, etc., that what people were going to do would be essentially rent them. Uh, and, you, and you've seen Adobe move to a um, subscription model, okay, of, of service, okay? And you're seeing Microsoft kind of move in that direction a little bit. And it could be that particularly for some of these uh, major applications that you're going to see more and more of that. Now, that sounds like a good idea because you always have the most current version of the application that your system could run, okay? But I can tell you that if you are in somewhere where you do not have a high-speed broadband connection, you have, you're going to have two problems. If the application requires that you constantly be connected to the internet, then that's not going to be good unless you have a stable connection. Now, most of them require basically that you, that the software be able to quote unquote phone home uh, to check to make sure that you're current with your payment. And then from then on, other than downloading updates, you would be able to run the software without being physically connected. That's what some of this software is doing right now. And that would be good uh, for people who have a slower connection. But, you know, every time there's a new uh, OS update, for example, a new Mac OS update, we get a post from forum members who live in areas of the world where they have a slow internet connection. So even if you only had to, let's say that you had uh, Photoshop, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm not picking on Adobe tonight. I'm just using that as an example. Let's say you had Photoshop and you've got an update to download. That update's going to go very quickly if you live somewhere with a high speed connection that's reliable. But if your connection is unreliable or you're in an area of the world where your connection is slow, it's going to be a problem for you. Uh, going over to a subscription-driven model or some cloud-driven model for software and software updates. Uh, I'm still one of those old-school kind of people. Let's face it, I'm old. 
I want to have the software. Okay. <laughs> I'm old. Okay. People who are younger than I am might be perfectly comfortable with this idea of essentially what amounts to streaming the software or or having the bulk of the software available to you and then having to download updates as i'm sure you know some of those updates uh can be quite extensive in terms of file size and the amount of bandwidth uh that's the other issue if you are in an area where your isp is capping bandwidth it, it wouldn't take very many software downloads of some of these major packages for you to exceed your uh, bandwidth allowance if you have a, a kind of small one. All right. Now, uh, let's move back. And I, and I put those things together because they're outside articles that are tied to a forum thread. Let's, let's get back to uh, some more things going on in the forum. And I, I mentioned this one because periodically, we run into uh, forum members who they may be experiencing some slowdowns with Safari. They don't like Safari or they don't like Chrome. They don't like Firefox. And uh, there was a thread going in the forum about some performance issues with, fire, with uh, Safari. And uh, our forum member, Randy B. Singer, uh, posted something, and I, and I put a link to this in the show notes, just so you you may find it helpful. I did not realize this. I thought I kept up with most categories of Mac software really well, but I did not realize that there are more than 200 web browsers available for the Macintosh. Uh, no, I didn't get it wrong. Okay, I didn't make a mistake. I did say more than 200 web browsers. Now, out of those 200, I have probably used five. I tinkered with Opera a little, a little bit when it first came out. I've tinkered with Firefox a couple of times. I've used Chrome, Safari, and back in the day when it was still viable, I used um, uh, what was Internet Explorer. For the Mac. Yes, there was an Internet Explorer version years and years ago. And I've tinkered with one or two others just Laura. for a for a few you know minutes here and there. I will say I've never been a big Firefox fan, but that's just me. Uh it looked too much like the PC when I first experimented with it, and I really didn't want something that looked like PC software. But one of the thing, one of the reasons I link to this thread is there, Randy has a link to some sites that review some of these browsers. So you don't have to try all 200 of them to find the one that you like best. Um, why would you need different browsers? Okay, uh, let me just give you an example. I have run into a couple of sites recently that seem to behave a little bit better with uh, Chrome than they do with uh, Safari. That's not a common thing, but it does happen from time to time. Uh, Opera has a few features in it that Safari does not yet have. But some of them are faster in rendering certain things. So uh, as Randy mentions later in that thread, uh, I think he has uh, three or four different browsers on his machine at any given time. I've got uh, three at the, well, four at the moment, if you count the one I downloaded last night. I don't use Firefox very much, although I have a version that, that I need to update. I don't use Chrome very often, but there are a couple of sites that I have to uh, use Chrome for because for some god awful reason the vendor uh, just cannot seem to make the site behave itself with Safari. Uh, but that's you know that's something that that pops up from time to time. So it, it's a good article. Uh, it's a good series of links to look at. Uh, particularly the first link in that site, uh, Newton De which has a review and it tracks a bunch of these uh, web browsers. So you'll be able to look at the features, look at some of the development, 
and see which one might meet your needs. All right, and uh, before we leave the show tonight, I do want to mention uh, Kirk, the iTunes guy again. He's been all over our show this week. It just, uh, I like reading his stuff in part because he knows his material and in part because uh, he is really good at fixing uh, iTunes issues, hence the moniker, uh, the iTunes guy. And I, I have to tell you, I like iTunes, but there are times when I just want to reach out and touch whomever built that program because it <laughs> occasionally behaves in ways that you just don't uh, understand. Uh, it took me forever to wrap my brain around how iTunes alphabetized things. Once I did figure it out, it was really simple to understand, but that was something that really needed to be uh, explained to me. Fortunately, I found some information online that took care of that. And this time, Kirk is talking about some situations where, where iTunes goes wild and kind of doesn't do what you expect it to. And what he's describing here as one potential problem, uh, essentially you got a, a note from a user that basically said when, that when they had re-imported the iTunes library file, what they got was a library that was out of date and it was out of date by about two years, okay? They found a lot of old playlists and things of that nature, and but did not find a lot of the current things that they had added over, I guess, a period of the last several months. And this really, I gotta admit, it would have really confused me until I read the article. Kirk reminds us that in earlier versions of iTunes, one format for the iTunes library was to save it as an XML file, and that allowed um, other third-party applications both uh, to access your library by accessing that file. It could read your library uh, and and do a variety of things. There were several apps that had that capability. Well, the problem is that Apple, at some point, I guess they decided that that really just was not working very well or wasn't working in the way that they intended it to work. So they stopped iTunes' ability to create that XML file automatically. And so what happens is if you have to rebuild your library, and you go back and you look at that XML file and you say, oh, gee, that's the way to go. That's how I'm going to do it. it it's not going to work very well. It's probably an old file. Uh, he has some suggestions for you in there, and he explains this a little bit better than I can. I'm going to tell you from personal experience, okay? This is me. This is somebody who has had to rebuild my iTunes library numerous times. Uh, either because of drive failures. I, I had a couple of drives inside NAS devices fail or because of my own stupidity. Okay, yes, I do make uh, mistakes on the Mac periodically and, really? cause, <laughs> and cause massive amounts of problems for myself. This is the one and only time I will admit that in a public place, thank you. So you guys better record this or, or save it off of YouTube, do whatever you're going to do. I'm never admitting this again, okay? <laughs> so when you make those kinds of mistakes, it means that you're going to end up rebuilding your library. And you have a number of options for that. Uh, one of them is to go back and manually reload all of that information. Now that's gonna mean finding the CDs and ripping them. And one of the things that Apple does to help you is that you can download, re-download without purchasing again, the information. You can download the movies and the and and the uh, uh, music that you've downloaded from the from the iTunes Store. 
if you just go into the store and you click on purchases and you click, I think it's one called not in my library, it'll show you the stuff that it has. Now, I will say this because I tried that a while back. I had to rebuild my library. I think it was about a year and a half or two years ago. And I discovered something somewhat disturbing. Uh, a friend of mine, I know last week you heard me mention that one of my friends is a relatively recent convert to Mac. And so there's some things about the Mac that he doesn't know, but he had told me because he had had his library fail that he was able to go into iTunes and download his content again. So I did that. After I did all of that, <laughs> after I did all of that, I made a remarkable discovery. On some of the albums that I had downloaded, um, there were tracks that were missing, particularly in compilation albums. And I later found out, um, and he, he, even though I tried multiple times to download it, the same tracks were always the ones that were missing. In other words, if track six was missing the first time I downloaded the album, then track six was going to be missing the second and third time I downloaded it. And uh, I found out later that sometimes this is because as various artists and record labels pull the rights from iTunes and say, okay, you no longer have the right to provide this in the iTunes store. Then they have to pull that and yeah, they're not disabling it if it's on your hard drive because you've already purchased it, but it means that they don't have the right to offer it to you as a re-download. Okay, so that meant that I had to go in and find the backup, a backup file that I had burned onto CDs, multiple CDs, and find the stuff and then reload it. Very time consuming uh, process. And to be honest with you, it was a royal pain in the keister. So this file, this problem with the XML file uh, is one thing that might cause some of those issues when you go to rebuild your library. But I have to tell you, uh, and Kirk has some ideas there. I will tell you the best way to preserve your iTunes library and avoid a lot of hassles is having multiple backups and check those backups once in a while to make sure that the files are still loading. Uh, one quick and dirty way to do that is to go into the backup, find some of your iTunes music, and you don't need to double click on it and reload it into iTunes because that's going to give you a duplicate. One way that you can test the integrity of the file is to go into your iTunes media, wherever you have that media folder, find some of your music, single click one of the files, and hit the space bar. That activates Quick Look, and Quick Look will play that file. If it cannot play it, then one of two things is true. It's either in a format that QuickTime doesn't understand, or the file may be corrupted, in which case you need to investigate what's what in terms of why it can't play. So that's something else for you to chew on this week. That ought to keep you a little bit busy. Um, and then finally here, I'm going to show you this one. Uh, thanks to Rad Dave for the uh, screenshots. Uh, Rad Dave is now pretty much the king of the forum screenshot. But he's got something that he answered someone's question in the forum. They wanted to know, about this weird looking sort of virtual button that was on their iPhone. And Rad Dave, uh, I think may have found what the issue is. And I'm gonna show you, I did a real quick recording of my iPhone screen. I wanna show you where that option might be so that you can check to see. Um, and it's gonna take me just a second to get it uh, up here, but that uh, you'll see real quickly I've got two different uh, iPhone things up here tonight as little movie clips. Okay, first uh, we'll get to the one on cell data usage in just a second. This 
is the one about the virtual button. The button that Rad Dave is talking about is this little square here, this sort of holographic looking square that's on, that you see on my iPhone screen. That square behaves like almost like a virtual home button. And you can, it, it's there for people who maybe have a little trouble physically accessing the home button. So let me show you how to turn this off and on. Okay, the first thing you're going to want to do, this should show up in just a second. You're going to want to go into settings. Now there you see the different things it can control. Okay, I can use it to scroll backwards without hitting the physical home button. All right, how did I get that on the screen? Okay, here's how. You're going to go into settings right there. It should pop up in just a second here. I think I recorded this correctly. You're going to go into settings and you're going to scroll down until you see the accessibility features. And down in the accessibility features, one of your options is assistive touch. If you turn that on, you get the button. If you turn it off, this button goes away. Some people who have trouble physically accessing the iPhone screen find that virtual button useful because you can touch that one area and bring up multiple things. Some people uh, do not find it useful. That's something that you can experiment with and see if you like it. Um, next week, I think I'm going to do a, an entire segment on the accessibility features in both the Mac OS and iPhone operating system. I didn't do it this week because I not only want to cover some real basics about why they're used and who might benefit from them, but I also want to show you some convenience things that might be useful to you even if you don't need the accessibility features. Now the other thing I want to show you is something else in settings. Um, some of us, I recently uh, downgraded the amount of cellular data I carry on my iPhone. Uh, my cell data plan is smaller than it used to be. And when you do that, one of the things you might want to do is get a look at which applications are using the most cellular data. Here's how you do it. First thing you want to do, you can see I'm back at the home screen here. Let me start the movie. I'm back at the home screen. Once again, I'm going to go to settings. Just about everything you want to change on the iPhone is there. I'm going to go to cellular, and then I'm going to scroll down, as you can see here in just a second. I'm going to scroll down, and if you look, it says use cellular data for, and app by app, it shows you how much uh, data each of these applications is using. So it's a good way to track some apps maybe that are using a little more information than you thought they were. Maybe they do some downloading in the background uh, that you have forgotten about. So it's a good way to monitor that just a little bit, especially if you see that your data usage is going uh, higher than you expect. It could be that an app that you've downloaded recently is um, using up a lot more data. Uh, for example, as you can see, my clock is only using 828, 826K. My uh, Candy Crush, which I don't play that often, is you, it has used about 6.3 megabytes. That's not a lot, but uh, the apps that are likely to burn a lot of data are not things that I run a lot, but that's something that you might want to keep an eye on kind of monitor for yourself and see how things go for you and pick pick some settings and shut some of these things off or on. The way to tell if they're green, it means that you've allowed them to use cellular data. If you flip it back so that it's, it's grayed out, then it's not gonna be using any more cellular data. All right, guys, that's gonna just about do it this week. Uh, yes, uh, we did have that monumental moment where I admitted that even I screw up. So you see what happens when you tune in regularly, you find out all kinds of things you want to know. Despite the fact that numerous people in the forum have referred to me as a genius, 
okay? And I have this on record. I have preserved it in, in threads and, and et cetera so that I can print this out and show it to people who don't believe me when I tell them this, okay? Uh, in spite of that, yes, even geniuses make mistakes from time to time. So you'll want to uh, keep this podcast around for uh, future reference so that you know that, yes, I did in public admit that I, I occasionally mess things up here and there. And that's going to just about do it for this week. The show notes are up already in the forum, in the uh, show thread. I'll put a link, a direct link to that uh, page so that you don't have to scroll through the entire thread. But if you have time to do that one day, uh, I suggest you might find it useful because as you scroll back through that thread, you'll find links to all the things that we've discussed previously. So uh, keep that in mind. And until next week, guys, uh, this has been your host, Sylvester Rock, AKA Sly Dude in, in the forum. I've enjoyed bringing you this week's show, and I hope that you find the information in it useful. And until then, until next week, we'll see you in the forum.